Where are you sitting? I can't find a place. Where are you sitting? Ah, I'm sitting. I always prefer a place where I can write. So I'm sitting in the front. Okay. Let's get started. I think we have kind of a packed program. So the next uh, lecture is by Zohar Komar Gotsky. He will tell us about quantum fields in three and four dimensions. Okay. Uh, it, it, it's okay, it's working, right? Is it working? No? It's working. Okay, thanks for coming uh, to my lectures. Uh, my lectures will be about the uh, 3 plus 1 and 2 plus 1 dimensional dynamics in quantum field theory. Uh, I'll try to cover uh, several topics, but not exhaustively, uh, more rather through examples, because the topics are too extensive to cover exhaustively from first principles. So rather, I'll give you a flavor of uh, some new ideas and uh, new tools uh, through examples rather than through an exhaustive, uh, you know, an exhaustive uh, coverage of these concepts. Now, of course, uh, uh, you, you're more than free, and you're encouraged to interject and ask questions whenever you have any, any questions about anything that I'm going to uh, discuss. And uh, furthermore, if there are any other comments uh, between the talks, after the talks, whenever you see me, also pl please feel free. Also, there are many experts in the audience, so uh, if you stumble me with some question that I don't know, I'm sure somebody will be able to help. Okay, so let's start. I wanted to start with some uh, general motivations uh, of uh, various ideas that uh, you might not be familiar with uh, if you haven't uh, studied this topic before. And then we'll start uh, covering some, uh, some uh, more concrete material. So the motivations are uh, quantum phase. I'll discuss a little bit about quantum phase transitions. I'll discuss some uh, conceptual ideas about quantum phase transitions that uh, are interesting. Then I'll discuss a little bit uh, the connection to Young-Mills theory. Uh, I'll discuss a little bit finite temperature, uh, finite temperature aspects of Young-Mills theory. I'm not going to discuss any of these topics exhaustively. It's just a, a bunch of motivations for physical problems where uh, these uh, kind of topics that I'm going to cover are useful. So let's start with the general concept of uh, uh, phase transitions or uh, quantum, quantum phase transitions or phase transitions more generally. So uh, in these uh, lectures, I'll be using some terminology that I want to now define. So this is going to be a little bit of terminology that will be useful. So suppose you have a quantum field theory in any number of dimensions, say d plus 1. And suppose you want, you're interested, so some people are interested in the massive excitations, people who dwell, you know, people who look for new resonances at the LHC obviously are more interested in the massive excitations, massive particles of quantum field theory. But um, a simpler problem that we might have a better chance of solving is to understand the vacua, just the deep, deep, long distance limit of quantum field theory. So we're going to discuss the uh, long distance limit or the low energy limit. So quantum field theories could have many types of vacua, uh, many types of low, long distance limits. And there is some terminology that uh, we need to all agree on when we uh, discuss these topics. So the question is, which kind of long distance limits could there exist in principle? So maybe just listing all the possibilities is kind of too much. I'll just get, uh, so I'll list the main options. 
And these main options uh, have some terminology associated to them. So the first option that <coughs> you are all familiar with is that the gap, uh, vacuum is gapped and trivial. That's, so if you have any, you have some vacuum in Q of T, every, everything, is, everything is massive, and there are no interesting observables that one can measure at long distances, then the vacuum is said to be trivial and gapped. Gapped means that there are no particles, and trivial, this word trivial would become apparent in a second. Okay. The next option that you are probably very familiar with is when the vacuum is gapless. When we say that it's gapless, there are actually two distinct options that appear very commonly in applications. The first option that appears in applications is when there are number Goldstone particles. And uh, number, Goldstone number Goldstone particles appear when there is a spontaneous symmetry breaking of a continuous symmetry. So here there is, this is associated to spontaneous uh, symmetry breaking of a continuous symmetry. That's one instance when we are, I mean, this is what happens in QCD when the massless, what's the so-called Cairo limit. The other situation when there are gapless modes is when we have a conformal field theory. Non-trivial conformal field theory. It could be trivial, but it could also be non-trivial. Conformal field theory. Now, conformal field theories uh, don't appear if you have a Hamiltonian with many parameters. You generally don't expect that there would be a conformal field theory for every value of these parameters. It might appear in some co-dimension space of the parameter space. And these points where it appears are usually called second order phase transitions. So this is usually called the second order transition uh, because it appears in some subspace of the phase diagram and it's a rather smooth transition, unlike the one that I'll mention soon. But there is yet another option that will actually be, play an important role in these lectures, which is that it's a topological field theory. So it's gapped, but non-trivial. Non-trivial and gapped. So this is the option that I wanted just to spend a minute on because it might be the less familiar one. It's not covered in at least the standard books that are used in graduate school in high energy physics. So, um, so this should be contrasted with the first option, which is trivial and gapped. So by non-trivial and gapped, what we mean is that the Hamiltonian, in fact, doesn't have any, uh, there, are no mass, there are no propagating degrees of freedom which are at zero mass. So there are no masses propagating the degrees of freedom. That's what the word gap stands for. But there is still something that one can measure at long distances. Even though there are no light particles, there is still something to be measured. So the idea of non-trivial is that we can measure something even though there are no light degrees of freedom. Even though there are no uh, massless degrees of freedom. And we can measure this something without investing any energy. Of course, if we pump up the energy, we can measure whatever we want. But we, the idea is that we can measure something with, without pumping any energy. So we can measure something without, uh, without pumping any significant amount of energy. So how can it be? How can it be that there is something to measure if there is no, if, how can it be that there is something to measure without even though there are no massless particles. The idea is that there could be non-trivial statistics, so to speak, in the infrared. So there could be some excitations that have non-trivial Aharon of bomb phases or braiding. Even though, we don't, even, though the, the, even though there are no massless particles, there could still be Aharon of bomb phases that we can measure. So what do we measure? We measure Aharon of bomb phases or generalizations of Aharon. Of course, there are non-trivial generalizations. So. Uh, by Aron of bond phases, I mean in some generalized sense. Aron uh, of bond phases. So, the simplest known example of 
non-trivial Aharon of bone phases that we can measure is, of course, from 2 plus 1 dimensions. But there are also 3 plus 1 dimensional examples. Uh, so the simplest example is in uh, 2 plus 1 dimensions. The theory could be completely gapped. But there could be anions. So there could be particles, heavy particles. Let's call them 1 and 2. So these particles will be heavy and non-relativistic, and you can just move them very, very slowly. Now, in a trivial gapped vacuum, you take two heavy particles, you move them slowly, you don't see anything. But if there are anions, by moving one particle across another, you can get a non-trivial phase, which is, let's say, delta 1, 2. So the wave function could be multiplied by a non-trivial phase in the simplest cases. And uh, that phase is measurable even when the process is very adiabatic and you don't invest any energy. So these are measurable observables. So this is a measurable observable that does not require pumping any energy. So this is our measurable observable. So I'll review the concept of anions. But of course, anions in this form are special to two plus one dimensions. Because if we take space to be R2, that's where we can braid particles across each other. In three plus one dimensions, we cannot just braid simply ordinary particles across each other, because you can always contract the loop by uh, lifting the particle off the board. But in two plus one dimensions, this can be, this can be realized. So uh, these are three distinct vacua that you could encounter in continuum quantum field theory at infinite volume. And on top of all that, there is also the concept of super selection sector. sectors. So on top of that, we have the concept uh, sup of super selection sectors, which I want to explain now. But before I go to super selection sectors, are there any questions about this terminology? Any complaints or? OK. So the concept of super selection sectors is that if you look at the vacua of quantum field theory, there could be several vacua that are exactly the generate, let's say. This could be some energy or potential, and this could be some field, some field space. There could be several vacua that are exactly the generate. Okay. This can happen in quantum field theory due to the breakdown of a discrete symmetry, for instance. So this could happen, this could be enforced, such a degeneracy could be enforced, such a degeneracy could be enforced uh, by many different ideas, such as a discrete symmetry, which is spontaneously broken, unlike continuous symmetry, which, which, which was discussed here. So this could be due, due to discrete symmetry, supersymmetry, uh, uh, like even in boiling water, uh, any, any first order phase transition. Any first order uh, phase transition, by definition, leads to a degenerate set of vacua, because what is a first, what is a first order phase transition? A first order phase transition is such a picture, right? the two vacua play this game. So at some point, they have to become degenerate. And uh, so such degeneracies can just appear accidentally in parameter space, in some co-dimension of parameter space, where two vacua become degenerate. So when we have this situation that there are several vacua, uh, several super selection sectors, uh, more precisely, each one of those has its own properties. They don't talk to each other in quantum field theory because what we do in quantum field theory in infinite volume is we fix the boundary conditions so that we live in one of those vacua. One has to do a little bit more work to try to get this vacua, vacua to communicate in, communi in continuum quantum field theory. Remember, in quantum mechanics, the wave function spreads. Let me just write it down. In quantum mechanics, the wave function spreads because in quantum mechanics, there is no space. It's in zero plus one dimensions. But uh, as soon as you have any space dimensions, you have to specify the boundary conditions for these fields at infinity. And once you have specified those boundary conditions, these don't talk to each other. So that's why they're called super selection sectors. One has to do a little bit more work to get them to communicate. I'll give you one example soon. But so, uh, so each one of those could have its own properties. 
So you could encounter situations where this is trivially gapped, this is non-trivially gapped, and this has a CFT. Okay, such things exist. So this classification pertains to each super selection sector on its own. And in fact, each, this could have Goldstone bosons, so there could be like a little, you know, Mexican head here. So there could be a Goldstone boson here, there could be a CFT here, there could be a topological filter here. Uh, this, yeah, I haven't said that piece of terminology yet, but when such observables exist, they are described by topological filters. The whole subject of topological filters, it's a, it's a claim to fame, is that it allows you to classify all the possible phases that can be measured long distances in gapped vacua. Okay, so the subject of topological filter is really about the classifications, the classification of all such possible uh, long distance phenomena, like a Aron of bomb type phenomena, and generalizations thereof. Okay, so when we discuss quantum filters, we uh, try to first understand how many vacua there are. That's the first property of the vacuum, uh, the, the first property of the long distance theory. How many super selection sectors are there? That's question number one. The second question is, what are the properties of each of the super selection sectors? Is it massless, is it massive? Is there a topological filter? Isn't there a topological filter? And uh, the last thing, the, okay. So th this is what we do when we try to discuss the long distance limit of quantum filtery. Then there is one more thing that you can do, which is a little bit more sophisticated, which I also want to explain generally. You can, get, you can try to get the super selection sectors to talk to each other, okay? Instead of just discussing each super selection sector on its own, you can try to get them to talk to each other. So this is a very intuitive uh, to understand in the language of first order phase transitions. In the first order phase transitions, say, like uh, when we have, you have the liquid phase of water and the vapor phase, there is a layer that separates them. So this is like an equilibrium uh, situation where there is a layer between the two phases. So this layer is like, this could be water, liquid water, could be liquid water, and this could be vapor. But you can construct a layer that separates them. So we can do the same in any quantum filter which has several super selection sectors. We can construct layers that separate uh, these uh, different super selection sectors. And these layers could, could have interesting physics of their own. And this is also part of the long distance theory uh, that is interesting to study. So the layers in a, a technical, well, the te technical term for these layers are called domain walls. And they exist whenever there are distinct super selection sectors. So they, they exist, they always, they exist whenever there are, whenever there is more than one, more than one uh, sector, super selection sector. So whenever there is more than one, you can always construct these layers. And the way you do it is let's say, let's call this vacuum number one. And let's call this vacuum number two. So what you do So what you do is that you, you just take this space, let's say that this is space, and you just decide that in one direction of space you have vacuum number one, and in another direction of space you have vacuum number two. If you're a lattice person, that's very easy to arrange. You have some fields, and there are several uh, super selection sectors for these fields, and you just impose the boundary conditions that when you go to infinity in one direction, you have vacuum number one, and when you go to infinity in the other direction, you have vacuum number two. So now the whole system has to find like an equilibrium, a minimum energy a state. But now it cannot be in any of the vacuum one or two, because the boundary conditions on the two sides are incompatible. So what the theory does is to build a layer, exactly like in the water vapor transition. There is a layer, and this layer is called the domain wall. And this domain wall lives in one dimension less, naturally. So this lives in uh, deep minus one, plus one dimensions. And there could be interesting physics on the domain wall. In some situations, there are interesting excitations that are trapped to the layer that cannot extend to the bulk. So sometimes there are trapped excitations on the layer. 
trapped excitations on the layer. And when there are such trapped interesting excitations on the layer, we can try to, try to study their physics. And, if, and, and then we're back to this, bit, to this terminology. We can try to understand if these excitations on the layer are trivially gapped, non-trivially gapped, and so on and so forth. So we can play this game. Also for the physics on these layers. Okay, so these are the objects that will appear in many different examples and in many different guises. Now what I want to show you is one example where these things come to life, which is just ordinary young Mills theory. So uh, I want, I'll give you some, uh, some facts about ordinary young Mills theory, uh, which employs some of these ideas. Are there any questions about the terminology? Or anything else? Okay. So again. So, what you, if, so how do you construct these uh, domain walls? As a lattice person, you just impose the boundary conditions at infinity. So what lattice people do when they try to understand the properties of some vacuum, they just impose that at infinity, the field goes to some values, which they find before to be the vacuum. And then the system does whatever it does. Uh, here they don't impose anything in the bulk. They just say that in one direction in space, phi has to go to the values of the fields at vacuum one, and in the other direction to the values of the fields in vacuum two. And then the system dynamically finds its uh, best configuration. And it, this best configuration uh, tends to have a layer which is pretty well localized in this, or in this space, in this direction. Because, I mean, if the layer was too big, you would have to pay a lot of energy because for a huge amount of space, you would be outside of the vacuum, right? The system really wants to be as much as possible in one of the vacuo one and two, because those are the lowest energy states. So if this layer where the transition between vacuum one and vacuum two happens was too big, it would not be very energetically efficient. So the system tries to stay as much as possible in, in each vacuum and then make a rapid transition. And this will have like some typical tension. It will cost some energy to make this transition, but it will be pretty well localized, localized in general. Yes. You, can, you must pick up. I'm either becoming deaf or it's just that you don't. <laughs> How does the system decide where exactly this domain wall is created? It's a fantastic question. So I, I, I didn't want to say it right away because it's a, it's a fantastic question. So the question is, uh, how does the system decide where to put this layer? So how does, the, how does water decide where to put this layer? What do you think? No? So how does the system decide where to put this layer? Um, so you see uh, the full Hamiltonian the laws of physics in the system, they have invariance under translational symmetry. Now, if you, you are in each, if you are in some vacuum, then you can construct configurations which are perfectly invariant under translational symmetry because you can be in the vacuum everywhere. So it's a perfectly homogeneous state. But these boundary conditions are such that you cannot really be in a translationally invariant state because you make, must make a rapid transition between vacuum one and vacuum two. So these layers break spontaneously trans translational symmetry. So such layers always break spontaneously a translational symmetry. Okay, that's fact number one. That means that there is always some physics on the layer that is non-trivial. There are a number of Goldstone bosons on the layer due to the spontaneous breaking of translational symmetry. So the layer doesn't have to be straight. Let me just draw a projection of it because it's harder to draw a two-dimensional plane. So the layer doesn't have to be strictly speaking straight. It could be a little bit like that and it would cost a tiny bit of energy like for any Goldstone bosons. You can excite them but it costs a little bit of energy. Okay, so the layer always has some uh, massless degrees of freedom that allow it to fluctuate. Condensed matter people call these degrees of freedom phonons. But here these phonons are sp somewhat special because uh, they come from the spontaneous breaking of translational symmetry in a system that started its life as a relativistically invariant system. 
So there are also some constraints on the Lagrangian for these phonons from boost. So here is your first exercise. It's actually a somewhat hard exercise, but it's very educational. So uh, the number of phonons is, of course, the number of transverse directions. So let i uh, equal, let's say, in this, in this situation that I'm discussing layers, there's always just one transverse direction. So let x be the transverse direction, be the field on the layer, which parameterizes the excitations of the layer in transverse directions, which is the phonon, okay? So this is the field, which is the phonon. So we have to write some Lagrangian for this field. So we have to write d, d, x. Now this is d, d, x, not d, d plus one x, because the layer lives in d minus one plus one directions. So we have to write some Lagrangian for this field, which is a function of this liter coordinates x. So let, let, let me just put here some symbols so that it doesn't get confused. So we have to find the Lagrangian for this field that would correctly capture the spontaneous breaking of translational symmetry and correctly reproduce the boost invariance of the system. So it turns out, so this Lagrangian is of course, in general, not something we can compute. And there, there's, there are complicated corrections uh, uh, which depend on derivatives of x. But there is a theorem that you can prove, this is your exercise. So you can prove that uh, if you only assume that the Lagrangian is a function of derivatives of x, okay, let's assume that the Lagrangian is only a function of derivatives of x. This is a natural assumption because translation, translating x by constant shouldn't affect anything. This is the statement that you made in the beginning that the layer doesn't know where to be. So translating x by an overall constant shouldn't be a big, a big deal. So the Lagrangian is expected to be only a function of derivatives. So your exercise is uh, to prove that uh, the only possible Lagrangian is the square root is the <clears throat> of the determinant of the unit matrix in d times d, d times d directions plus d i x d j x where you take the determinant over the indices i and j. Now, have you seen this uh, Lag Lagrangian before? Have any, has anybody seen this Lagrangian before? Nambugoto. This is not born in infill, it's just Nambugoto. This is called the Nambugoto Lagrangian. So the Lagrangians of De Bruyne's in string theory always look like that, but <laughs> The content of these Lagrangians is nothing more than Lorentz invariance. That's a point that's not stated in many string theory books or, but it just follows from Lorentz invariance. That this is the only possible form and you can prove it yourself. It's a hard but not an undoable exercise. Now, this is not the full Lagrangian as I told you. There are some corrections that could depend on second derivatives of x, which we don't know. Uh, but this part is universal. And the coefficient here is the tension. Okay. That's the tension of the layer. Does anybody know the tension of the layer in water vapor? Does anybody remember? I think it's like 500 calories per gram. So it's an object with some natural units that measures how much energy you gotta pay uh, to, to create this layer, okay? Fine, so that was, now there was another question, yeah. Ah, I, I mentioned here briefly that supersymmetry leads to superselection sectors. So the question is why, does, why did I mention supersymmetry here? It's, not, it's, it's a fact of life that in many supersymmetric models, there are many that generate vacua. The, reason, the fundamental reason being that without supersymmetry, the energy of the vacuum is not a very well-defined concept. You could shift it by an overall constant and in general vacua could, do, could move like that. But in supersymmetry there is like a special a value of the energy which is zero in some convention, some natural convention. And so vacua cannot play this game if they start at zero. They can only 
uh, move horizontally. And so it's common that there are degeneracies because they cannot move like that if they already touch zero. Any last questions? Okay, now I just want to give you an example for, the fla for how natural, how do you get naturally from the point of view of particle physics any ions or topological field theories. Now, in condensed matter, uh, in condensed matter theory, uh, anions and topological phases and two plus one dimensional quantum field theories, they arise naturally in, in materials like quantum hole, ma quantum hole droplets and others. But in high energy physics, it's a little bit, in high energy physics, uh, there are other constructions that also lead naturally to anions. And I just want to mention quickly one of those. Uh, it would not be pedagogical. It's just an example that you would bear something in mind. Maybe in the future you could learn about it if you wanted. And then I'll get to some more concrete discussions. So I want now, what I'm going to do now is I'll, I'll give you an example from high energy physics. So Young-Mills theory in three plus one dimensions, where these concepts uh, come into play, where these concepts are important, okay? Where these concepts are important and they appear non-trivially. Okay, so this example, I, I'm saying again, I'll just give you facts about this example and then you can read about it. But it's just like so that you, say, you, have some, uh, you have some idea of where some of these models could come from, the models that we'll discuss later. Okay, so let's consider SUN, SUN Young-Mills theory. No supersymmetry and no matter fields. Just pure Young-Mills theory. Okay, uh, this is just SUN gauge theory. So question number one, what do we know about the vacuum of this theory? Does anybody know? What do people expect about the ground state in this terminology that we uh, already explained? What do people expect generally from the vacuum of this theory? Gapped, but we had two options for gapped. Trivially gapped or non-trivially gapped? Non-trivially gapped. Okay, why? Um, no. So it's supposed to be trivially gapped. There is a clay, a clay prize for that. Yeah, that's the million dollars prize by the Clay Foundation. Uh, this vacuum is supposed to be unique and trivially gapped. Now, the gentleman here mentioned instant on vacua. Well, I didn't put a theta term yet. This is a theta equals zero. I'll put a theta term in, the, in a second. Um, the instanton vacua that you mentioned, what they do is that they introduce some additional kind of metastable states, but these are not genuine superselection sectors because they are not degenerate. Okay, so these are not vacua. If you wait for a long enough time, this will decay. So these do not count when we do the strict infrared long distance analysis. Because if you try to set up the boundary conditions to be in this vacua, there will be huge bubbles of the correct vacua that pop out and they will eventually wipe out the whole thing. So these are this what's called instant on vacua, but they don't need they don't affect the long distance physics and the vacuum is trivially gapped. There is a unique trivially gapped vacuum, that's what everybody expects. Now, something a little bit more interesting happens when we add a theta term. There is the strong CP problem, which is associated to the ter theta term, and the theta term also leads to non-trivial, uh, let me just put an epsilon tensor here. Um, okay. So this was the picture at theta equals zero. Theta equals pi, something a little bit more dramatic happened. There is a special value of theta, which is pi, where something a little bit more dramatic happens. As I said, I want 
I won't try to explain why. I'm just telling you a fact that, uh, that could motivate you to study that. And uh, so at theta equals zero, we said it's trivially gap. Okay? And at theta equals pi, uh, it turns out that what happens is that there are two vacua, each of which is trivially gapped. At theta equals pi, we have two vacua, which are exactly degenerate, and they're both trivially gapped. So, okay. so this, is a, uh, this is what happens if you take young Mills theory theta equals pi. You have two vacua, which are, which are each of which is trivial. There is no topological field theories. There are not topological filters in them, but uh, there are two. So, in fact, this is related to the instant on vacuo that you mentioned. What happens intuitively is that when you change theta, these things move a little bit. And it's exactly theta equals pi, they, this and that guy become degenerate. Okay, so theta equals pi is like a first order phase transition where these two vacuo change. So you could think about it as a first order phase transition. So this is like a first order transition. Okay. So this is the fact about young mills theory. Now you can ask what happens when you construct a layer, right? Uh, this is where it becomes really interesting. Let's call this vacua one and two. Since they're both exactly degenerate and trivially gapped, we can construct a layer. This is something that people could do on the lattice in the future and they could test what I'm telling you about it. So we can construct such a layer. And we've already learned uh, that this layer has some phonons, so it allows the layer to fluctuate in the orthogonal directions. But that's boring, that's just from translational symmetry breaking. It's a universal property of any layer. The question is if this layer has something more than just, something more than just a, a, this uh, phonons. And so let me tell you some things about it that uh, this is like an invitation to study uh, two plus one dimensional dynamics. So the physics of this layer, the physics of this domain wall, uh, has two components. Has two components. The first component is what we just discussed. This is the phonon, which is described by the nambu goto action. The second component is uh, much more surprising, and it cannot be understood from symmetry breaking alone. It's more exotic. It turns out that there, are top, there is a topological field theory. And this is much more mysterious um, uh, in, in two plus one dimensions, because the layer is two plus one dimensional two plus one dimensions. So now I'll tell you what this uh, topological field theory physically means. And then we'll start discussing something more concrete. So what happens on this layer is that uh, there are various objects that behave like anions. So if they take, you take them across each other, you get some funny phases, Aron of bomb like phases. And you could ask, what are these anions in terms of you know, the underlying degrees of freedom, which are the SUN gauge fields, and maybe some heavy quarks that are probe quarks. It turns out that these anions, are what start, their, these anions started their lives as, as quarks. So the quarks, when you take a quark in three plus one dimensions, it's confined, so you can never observe a quark in isolation. So quarks in three plus one are confined. But when you bring them close to the wall, they become anions. So even though quarks start their life as objects with a spin which is integer or half integer, depending if your quarks are scalars or fermions, like in the universe, when you bring them close to the wall, they acquire fractional spin. 
and they behave like anions, and they deconfine, so you can observe them in isolation. So they have fractional spin, and they deconfine. So you can observe them in isolation. Okay. So this is one construction within just pure young mills theory that naturally leads to topological order, topological filters on the wall, uh, and to very interesting physics uh, associated to uh, the statistics of quarks and some fen interesting phenomena in young mills theory. So my goal would therefore be to study more systematically two plus one dimensional systems, like the one that appears here on the wall, uh, which involve initially just ordinary phase transitions, but then also anions and uh, such things. And many of the systems that we'll discuss can be constructed you, uh, starting from QCD like theories and studying the physics on some layers or domain walls. Correct, these are probe quarks. So if you want, I can add heavy quarks. If you want this to be, if, if you want what I'm saying to be, sorry, you asked the question? Yeah. If you want what I'm saying to be perfectly uh, concrete, just add heavy quarks here. Okay, heavy dynamical quarks. So they don't fluctuate, but you can excite them and then check their statistics. The, so if you, like a top quark, so if you have a citric gauge theory with a heavy top quark, you cannot separate the top quark. As you know, if you try to separate the top quark, there is always like a buildup of pions around it, and there is like, it, it, for, it fractionalizes or hadronizes into mesons and uh, various heavy, uh, heavy states. So this would be like that in the bulk. But what I'm saying is that if you bring it close to the wall, then it acquires fractional spin. And the fractional spin can be even computed. It turns out to be 1 over 2n. So it acquires fractional spin, and you can then measure it in isolation, and you can take a top quark around another top quark and just measure this 1 over 6, uh, the fractional spin, if n is 3. So this is a, a, a fun fact about young mills theory, which is supposed to be just a motivator to study a little bit more systematically two plus one dimensional systems. So now I'm gonna jump in, if there are no more questions, and I'll start with the simplest possible two plus one dimensional dynamics, which is the O2 model. Yes. Could you just pick up? Okay, so the gentleman is asking a very nice question of why are the quarks deconfined? So in the, seven, in the 80s and the 70s, people came up with phenomenological models for confinement. People wanted to understand why quarks are confined in space, in three plus one dimensional space. And what people said was that there's something that's called monopole condensation. It's, a, it's like a mythical object that uh, you cannot prove exists, but that's what people say causes quark confinement in three plus one dimensions, okay? However, if you ask them about this situation in the 70s or 80s, what they would have told you is that here in this vacuum, the monopole condenses, and that's why quarks are confined. But in this vacuum, the dion condenses. That's a phenological picture that they would have told you in the 80s. And so here quarks are confined and here quarks are confined. But then here they would be conflicted because you cannot condense both. They are mutually non-local. So what they would have told you probably, I'm just putting words in their mouth. So what we are saying now about this is that since here the dion condenses, here the monopole condenses, here neither of them can condense, and therefore there must be deconfinement. Okay, because you cannot condense them both uh, simultaneously, they're mutually non-local, so instead none of them condenses, and so there is deconfinement. It's like you're forcing the monopole condensation to disappear on the layer, and therefore the quarks get liberated. Okay. Yes. So the question is, if there is a domain wall, if there are, I think, well, I might be over. I, I don't. Whenever you have two vacua which are exactly degenerate, there is always a way to make them communicate. 
Now, it could be that the, the barrier between them is infinite. And then, um, and then you'll get a slightly singular object. But if the energy barrier between these two vacua is finite, then there must be a way to make them communicate through this layer. I mean, I think about it on the lattice, that you can just force the lattice to be in one vacuum on one side at infinity and in another vacuum on the other side. So what is the lattice going to do? It's not going to tell you I don't want to compute. It's going to compute and find the lowest energy state, which must look like that. Yeah. These were, in the past, people thought about them as sort of a, what causes confinement. Yeah, monopole condensation or dying condensation is what's supposed to trigger confinement. It's a qualitative phenomenological picture. There is no order parameter here. It's not a rigorous order parameter for anything. Any other questions? Okay, okay so now I want to jump in. Um, my uh, plan is to first cover the O2 model which is also called the model of superfluidity, or the XY model, in 2 plus 1. Then I will cover particle vortex duality. And then we will add uh, topological field theories. We'll, we, I will cover a little bit of topological field theory, just the basics. And then we will discuss generalizations of particle vortex duality, generalizations of particle vortex duality with topological field theories, with anions, okay? So we'll discuss uh, generalizations of particle vortex duality where neither the particle nor the vortex are actually particles, they're anions. So, so it shouldn't be called particle vortex duality, it's like anion vortex anion duality. So with anions. And uh, eventually, I'll make contact between that and this. So I'll give you a, a more concrete picture for the dynamics of the wall of uh, you know, SU2 gauge theory with one quark uh, using this story. So we'll make contact between these two pictures. And if I have time, I will also discuss non-abelian anions and the dynamics of uh, three, two plus one dimensional QCD. Non-abelian uh, anions and dualities. Okay, so let's start. I'll just do a little bit of the beginning, give you a little bit of uh, homework uh, exercise and, and we'll continue on Sunday. Oh, sorry, on Monday. So the, I'm going to, for the duration of these lectures, until the very end, when I'll discuss maybe this and the connection to that, I'll be in two plus one dimensions, okay? So it's going to be in two plus one dimensions for the, for the rest of these lectures. The reason that we focus on two plus one dimensions because uh, the interesting stuff has to do with these anions, and anions exist only in two plus one dimensions. There, is also topological there are also topological filters in three plus one dimensions, but they're much harder to come by. They're not completely well understood yet, and, and so on. So the simplest known examples are in two plus one dimensions at the moment. So we're now starting from the O2 model, which in the literature is also called the XY model. I'll tell you in a second why. So the Lagrangian, it's the simplest possible uh, Lagrangian you could write for a single complex scalar field. So phi is a complex scalar field. So let's uh, let's write uh, uh, the, the well. Let me first tell you why it's called the XY model. It's because of the deep deep fact that if you have a complex scalar field, you can decompose it like this, as a sum of two real fields, which are called X and Y. So that's why people call it the XY model. Anyway, um, the symmetry of this model. Uh, 
the symmetry of this model, uh, does maybe anyone, anyone want to contribute? What is the symmetry of this model? Well, it's, yeah, it's U1, SO2, but the reason it's called O2 is because it's the symmetry of the model. Yeah, so the symmetry is O2. SO2 is obvious, and uh, the O just takes phi to phi star. Okay, it's generated by rotations of phi and by complex conjugation of phi, which together form the group O2. Now, it's interesting to study the phases of this model. Okay, this model is super important because it describes, a, it describes a superfluidity in condensed matter and in high energy physics it appears in so many applications it's hard to count. Um, this model is a very important universality class. L l now I'm gonna draw the phase diagram. I'm always gonna do it like on this kind of fashion. Um, this is gonna be M squared. And M squared can be huge and positive or huge and negative. So of course this model when this model has a parameter, lambda, which has dimensions of mass. And this sets essentially the scale, the energy scale, where the model is strongly coupled. Okay? So this is the strong coupling scale because you know if you are at energies below lambda, uh, uh, these interactions are very strong by the Wilsonian general paradigm below. Okay, I'll just write it down. So lambda is, uh, lambda is the scale of strong interactions, scale of interactions. If you erased, if lambda was zero, this model would have been free and we could have solved it at all energy scales easily. It would be a free field theory. But since lambda is present and this is a quartic nonlinear vertex, the model develops strong interactions at the scale lambda. So if the energy is much, much smaller than lambda, we're in trouble. We don't know what to do. But at energy is much above lambda, we're in good shape. This is easy and this is hard, okay? So the trick to understand these models is to think about this m squared. Because if m squared is huge in units of lambda, we don't need to study the model below the scale lambda because already at m squared, we can integrate out phi and forget about it. So if m squared is much bigger in absolute value than lambda, we can understand the model. Because the dynamics of the model happens at very high energies, much before the model becomes uh, strongly interacting. So when we draw these phase diagrams, we are always gonna try to study the weak coupling limits of these phase diagrams and then try to patch it up. So it's like a patchwork. You have to understand the easy limits and then try to understand what happens in the hard limits when the mass is very small. So of course here there are dragons, we don't know. This is when the mass is small. We cannot compute anything and it's up to conjectures or up to the lattice or up to maybe future, uh, future developments to decide. But we can say what happens outside of this region which is tough. So what happens when the mass is huge and positive, mass squared is huge and positive? Well when it's huge and positive the potential has one minimum, or oh, I should have said this is very crucial, otherwise the model is kind of sick. So when M squared is huge and positive, the potential has one minimum. Everything is trivially gapped, obviously. There is nothing. And so there is a trivially gapped vacuum here. One trivially gapped vacuum. But when M squared is huge and negative, when M squared is huge and negative, there is a more interesting phase because the potential now has a bunch of minima which are exactly degenerate, a la this Mexican hat. So in this limit, uh, the O2 symmetry is spontaneously broken. Here there is spontaneous symmetry breaking, but the O2 symmetry is broken to Z2, so only this complex conjugation symmetry remains, but the SO2 part is gone, and therefore we have a number Goldstone boson. And so this is the picture. We have this Mexican head kind of picture. And we can write the effective Lagrangian in this phase easily. The effective Lagrangian is just that of a single Nambu Goldstone boson. So the Lagrangian is just the, uh, let's call the angle theta, 
the data squared up to some coefficient. Okay, where theta is the number Goldstone boson. It's a compact, compact phase. Compact, a compact uh, uh, target space, which is isomorphic to S1. <laughs> now, this question of why there is a Z2, it's a homework exercise. I want you to convince yourself that O2 is not broken con completely. Rather, it's broken to Z2. So this is homework exercise number two. Why is O2 broken to Z2? Okay, why is there Z2 symmetry that's unbroken? If anybody wants to say the answer now, it's also acceptable. Um. Okay, so even if you don't know how to compute, I have one hour exactly right. So if you don't know how to compute in this region where the, with the question marks, which we don't know, you cannot say much. But you can say something very important, which is that clearly there must be a phase transition. Because here you have a number Goldstone boson. This vacuum is, has, this vacuum is gapless. But well, this vacuum is gapped. So there must be something here. If somebody told you that there is nothing here, it would be a contradiction. Because there must be some point where the two uh, descriptions are in conflict. So there must be either a, sec either a first order transition or a second order transition. So there must be something. So there must be something in the region with the question marks. So there must be some sort of phase transition. You can establish it just from the semi-classical analysis. And here, I'm gonna tell you the answer. Uh, that's what we believe from the lattice. We cannot prove it, but we are a Lattice has assertively established that uh, this is a second order transition. The, namely, it's a conformal field theory. And this conformal field theory is called the O2 Wilson Fisher conformal field theory. It's a conformal field theory about which we know quite a bit from the lattice and from the bootstrap. So the phase diagram can be summarized as follows there is one special point where there is a conformal field theory in two plus one dimensions. It's a non-trivial conformal field theory, by the way. So it's a non-trivial conformal field theory, meaning it has non-trivial scaling exponents. And here there is a number Goldstone, here there is the number Goldstone phase, which we'll study now in, in detail. Uh, and here there is a trivially gapped phase. And this is M squared. So that's what we believe uh, happens in the O2 model as a, function of, as a function of M squared. Now, notice that I did not vary lambda. I only studied as a function of M squared, but I did not study what happens as a function of lambda. And the reason being that lambda is irrelevant. Lambda is something that just flows and it's fixed at the conformal filter and it's not a relevant perturbation. If you study the spectrum of this conformal filter, it has one relevant perturbation, which is the mass squared. But lambda is not a relevant perturbation. So that's why we don't vary lambda when we draw this phase diagram. It's irrelevant in the technical sense. It's just an irrelevant operator at long distances. You could ask what happens to the vacuum if I change lambda. The answer is nothing. That's what Wilson taught us, right? Irrelevant operators don't change the answer for the long distance physics. So that's why I don't vary lambda because from this whole story we learned that lambda is irrelevant. But m squared is relevant, and indeed changing m squared changes the vacuum dramatically. You could say that m squared is irrelevant here, and you would be right. If you change m squared from this to that, it doesn't matter. The long distance physics remains trivial. But m squared is very relevant around this transition, because it makes the long distance physics change discontinuously. Okay, I'll just say what I'm gonna do tomorrow. One minute. So tomorrow we'll study some Interesting properties of this phase. We'll study something, we'll study vortices uh, a little bit in this phase. And then we'll start discussing duality. So tomorrow we'll do 
study of this phase and duality. Vortices and duality. Okay, let's thank Zohar. Yeah.